Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Megan Glenn. I'm the National Assistant Director of Programs at the American Liver Foundation, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, made possible by the generous support of Gilead Sciences. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. We provide a voice for patients with liver disease and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. I would like to thank Dr. Hashim B. El Sarag, who will be sharing his expertise on today's webinar. This webinar has been jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and the American Liver Foundation. We will be um, offering continuing education credits for today's webinar and will provide instructions on how to retrieve these credits at the end of the webinar. Let me just start with a few housekeeping items. On the upper right hand part of the screen, you should see a dialog box. If you don't see it, there's an orange arrow you can use to expand the window. From here, you can ask questions. You can ask questions at any time and we'll be answering them in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar. We will get to as many questions as possible and we welcome your participation, so please do send questions in. I would now like to introduce Dr. Emmanuel Thomas. Dr. Thomas is in his fifth year as an assistant professor at the University of Miami School of Medicine and an active member of the American Liver Foundation Southeast Division Board of Directors and Medical Advisory Committee. Thank you, Megan. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Hashim El Sarag today, who is the Margaret Nabert Alkek Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Dr. El Sarag is a fellowship trained clinical gastroenterologist and hepatologist. His research focuses on the clinical epidemiology and outcomes of several digestive disorders, including hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatitis C. He's obtained more than 50 funded research grants, including those from the NIH and VA. He has more than 450 papers, including those published in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and Gastroenterology. He has served multiple national leadership roles, including Editor-in-Chief for Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and he's President-Elect for the American Gastroenterological Association. Dr. El Sarag's achievements have been recognized in multiple national and international awards, as well as selection into the American Society for Clinical Investigators and the American Association of Physicians. Thank you, Dr. El Sarag, for sharing your expertise with us today, and I'm turning over the webinar to you now. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, my objective is to uh, touch on three broad themes. First, to recognize the treatment for hepatitis C with the new directly acting antiretrovirals. That's an abbreviation that I'll keep repeating, DAAs, can reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm going to discuss, uh, hopefully, you'll be able to discuss with hepatitis C positive patients their risk of HCC with or without the infection and therefore the possible benefits and potential harms, at least put it in context, adhere to HCC surveillance guidelines for at-risk patients. So I'll start first by a world map color-coded showing the mortality from liver cancer. And by liver cancer here, for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a primary liver cancer, not metastatic, that arises typically in a diseased liver, typically with cirrhosis. And the four main causes of liver cancer are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, alcoholic liver disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So going back to the map, the redder the area, the higher the burden of hepatocellular carcinoma. And you see there are pockets of deep red in Southeast Asia and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. These areas have a high endemic areas or high endemicity for hepatitis B, where it's transmitted from mother to child or during early childhood. See through the different shades of red, and please notice in the U.S., we're sort of in an intermediate area of uh, liver cancer burden. So just general points to know about this important liver cancer, or important cancer, 
Um, 80% of it happens in developing world and the relevance to your practice is uh, individuals who come first degree or first uh, uh, generation immigrants from high uh, areas for liver cancer tend to be at a high HCC risk and therefore should be considered uh, differently when it comes to HCC surveillance guidelines. Hepatitis B, which we will not talk about today, is the main cause of liver cancer worldwide. And just to remind you, a plug-in that hepatitis B vaccination is cheap, effective, and has the potential of reducing Hep B to zero. Today, we'll be dealing with hepatitis C. There's 160 million infected people. Of those, 4 million are estimated to live in the United States. And liver cancer in general worldwide is a major problem, 100 million liver cancer deaths in the 21st century. The good news, and hence the talk of today, is uh, virtually all but 90% of liver cancer causes are known, and I mentioned these four, and hep C it happens to be a well-defined cause. Shifting to another type of map, also showing the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma in the United States, showing it in three different years, 2003, 2007, 2012. The redder the, the color, the higher the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. At least a couple of observations. One is more states are becoming more red, which means the incidence of HCC has been rising over time. Second, a cluster of hepatocellular carcinoma high states in the southern border and western states. Uh, my state of Texas leads the way now as the uh, state with the highest incidence for HCC. Uh, second to it is Louisiana and Alaska. Uh, but all the red states have quite high rates of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Another important finding that uh, should alert you clinically to the subgroups at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma is shown on this slide. This shows the age-adjusted incidence rates for four major ethnic racial groups in the United States. And please notice that in 2012, the blue line, which used to be second from the top, denoting Hispanics, have become the number one. In other words, hepatocellular carcinoma uh, now affects Hispanic disproportionately more than any other ethnic group. So they're past, uh, surpassed uh, uh, Asian Americans for the first time in 2012. But you also notice that all ethnic groups, with the, expect, with the exception of Asians, uh, have been uh, affected by an increase in the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is an important cancer that affects major ethnic groups, most of which are growing. And if you want sort of a, a, a memorable statement, HCC today is the cause of, or the, the cause of the fastest rising cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States. Fastest uh, cause. Um, an important reminder and back to the basics, for practical purposes, all the cases that you're going to see in this country are related to an underlying presence of cirrhosis of the liver. It's practically a precursor lesion for HCC. Inactive, which means untreated or uncured hepatitis C, the annual incidence per year is 3%. So if you keep someone alive with cirrhosis with hep C for 10 years, the likelihood of having cancer is 30 to 40%, which is quite high. That's why, if you don't remember anything from the stock, patients with cirrhosis are at a high risk of HCC and therefore should be considered for surveillance for HCC using ultrasound and alpha fetoprotein. There used to be a time where I would spend the entire hour talking about the risk factors for why someone who gets infected with hepatitis C would move from an enormous liver into a cirrhotic liver. And only 20 to 30% of hep Cers would move to cirrhosis. And then a fraction, as I mentioned, 3% per year would move to HCC. And 
in the absence of effective treatments, most of our practice and therefore most of our talks have focused on prognostication. So we used to talk about the degree of fibrosis, degree of inflammation, the persistent elevation of ALT. We used to talk about male and age and obesity and co-infection, certain types of immune compromises, the amount of steatosis on liver biopsy, iron overload, genotype for the virus itself, heavy alcohol consumption, tobacco use. Uh, life has changed in a modern practice. The reason or the only risk factor that remains of any significance, with the exception of cirrhosis, is the receipt of antiviral treatments and the achievement of this three-lettered acronym SVR. SVR refers to sustained virological response, which in the case of hepatitis C refers to virological cure. So I may be referring to SVR or cure or both. They're virtually synonymous. So in the presence of an antiviral treatment with SVR, all of this big list disappears uh, except for cirrhosis, which makes the epidemiology relatively easy but makes the task of the clinician important. So detection and treatment becomes the altering risk factor or alterable important risk factor for HCC and hepatitis C. Could you please advance the next slide somehow? Yeah. And just to remind you, um, again, there used to be time when we spend hours comparing which medicine does what to which virus. Uh, if you go to a hepatitis C treatment talk, um, it's, it's two things. It's exciting and it's boring. It's exciting because the cure rate is unbelievable. It's boring because it's all high. So this is sort of a, a summary slide from different studies showing the efficacy of one selected treatment and there are multiple other treatments, and the slides are all shades of this, upper 90s to 100%. Virtually everyone who gets treated in a modern hepatology practice gets cured, if not from the first treatment, then from the second. So just this, to anchor this in context, because the rest of my talks will be about what happens after treatment, but it's very important to, for you to know and remember that the treatment now is curative in as short as eight weeks. The average is 12 weeks for most patients. The side effects are minimum to non-existent, and the options are many. You're bound to work in a system where one or more of these treatments are approved for treatment. So this is one study of many that has addressed the same question, which is what happens to patients with hepatitis C once they're cured, i.e. achieved SVR, with the new DAAs to their risk of HCC. I chose this study because it's ours, so it's easy, easier for me to explain. This is a national VA study, 100 plus hospitals, mustering a large number of patients who got treated with DAAs, and it shows the cumulative incidence of HCC on the y-axis and the duration in months after the treatment. So the first important finding that the small people, the small number of people who didn't achieve SVR, I told you already it's 90%, but 90% plus means a small proportion doesn't get cured. And if you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of patients, a study like that will muster enough patients to examine. The risk of HCC is high and goes uh, up with time. Those who achieve SVR there is a considerable and dramatic reduction in the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's observation number one. Observation number two, unfortunately, in the group that is cured, the risk does not go back to zero, at least after 20 months of follow-up. So treatment, considerable reduction in risk of HCC, but doesn't go back to zero. So we examined who are the unfortunate few who develop HCC 
after they receive the treatment and after they receive SVR. This is probably one of the most important slides in this presentation. This axis shows the incidence rate per year, per 100% meaning per year. And these are the risk factors. We thought a priori that the presence of cirrhosis at the time of the treatment would be the most important factor, and we were right. So those with cirrhosis, their overall risk after cure is 1.82%. Anchor this into my slide that shows 3%. It's half of what it used to be when the infection is active, but it is high. High enough, and that's an important number also for you to keep in mind. 1% per year is just about the threshold after which surveillance for HCC is recommended by most guidelines. So after cure of hepatitis C, achieving SVR with DAAs, those who have cirrhosis retain a high risk, high enough to continue surveillance for HCC. The other thing is going back to my slide, four or five slides ago, that it doesn't matter. Age, diabetes, alcohol, drugs, etc. The risk is high and remains consistently high. The only thing that matters is that Latinos with cirrhosis seem to be higher than the rest of them. What about those without cirrhosis? Those without cirrhosis, their overall risk is 0.2%. That's very low, doesn't warrant surveillance and therefore they're, they're almost home free. And it doesn't matter what the other factors are. So the message here is catch them early before they develop cirrhosis and you have a much better chance of reducing the risk of HCC to virtually zero. Catch them at the time of cirrhosis. You do them still a whole lot of good, but they're not out of the woods and the risk of HCC remains high. This is another study using the national VA databases, looking at the same question and adding another layer to it. The other layer is, there used to be the treatment called interferon. Injections, lots of side effects, very few people achieved cure, but interferon had those magical immunological properties that led people to think, well, maybe if you got your cure through interferon, you would do better as far as your HCC risk than if you got your cure through DEAs. And the answer is not true. So the, you don't need to be a statistician to look at those two graphs. They look the same. There isn't much of a numerical difference between the two. You can look at the hazard ratio of HCC between interferon-based treatment and DEA treatment and it's 1.12, and the confidence intervals overlap the one. The other important message, and just to emphasize it again, one is free of cancer. So the group that virtually does not develop cancer is, yes, you guessed it, no cirrhosis, and you cured them. The green means lots of cancer, and that would be cirrhosis and no cure. Somewhere in between are the no cirrhosis with cure or the other group, okay? So not to bore you with additional studies, there have been lots of studies, 19, that's at the time of publication of this meta-analysis in 2017, and there have been probably another half a dozen, which basically shows a reduction in the risk of HCC de novo as well as recurring, and I'll explain this in a little bit, but uh, the book is more or less closed on whether DEAs reduce the risk of HCC and whether they reduce it at least to a similar degree to interferon uh, in this case. The gold standard, now you would wonder after 19 studies, and I told you another half a dozen after 30 studies, why would get a study gets published this year in the Lancet because this is a prospective, multi-center French, and there's this European bias in the Lancet too, including 10,000 subjects, and it looked at all-cause mortality, hepatocellular carcinoma, decompensation of cirrhosis, and uh, this is the unadjusted value, and this is adjusted for all the confounders they have. I just wanna focus on this one. It does remind you of all the previous retrospective studies, 
In other words, there have been a reduction in the risk of HCC in a prospective, very well done cohort of patients who received DEAs and got cured. Okay. And that is compared to the untreated. So the untreated is the group that, that, that is in blue, and uh, the red is the one that received the HCC. And the confusing this part of this graph is, is going down is good as opposed to staying as it is. All right. So a slight digression, but an important clinical thing for you to remember, that there are groups for which or for whom HCC surveillance is recommended. By surveillance meaning the most commonly recommended surveillance tool is an ultrasound of the liver and a blood test, alpha fetoprotein, every six months in those who tolerate them and in whom the ultrasound is adequate. And these groups are, I wanna just go to the bottom here, hepatitis C cirrhosis, if the threshold exceeds a 1.5% uh, per year. And notice here that three to 5% is the untreated incidence of HCC. Try to use your memory now and remember our VA slide. After treatment and cure, 1.8%. It still exceeds this threshold, and therefore it's cost-effective to survey. Added benefit for you in terms of knowledge, hepatitis B, irrespective of cirrhosis in men older than 40, hepatitis B women older than 50, hepatitis B with family history of HCC, and of course, cirrhotics hepatitis B carriers. So. So one important aspect of my talk today is, is, is what do you do after you cure uh, patients with hepatitis C in terms of their uh, surveillance for HCC? All right. Um, multiple studies answer this question. I showed you the 1.8% per year. There are many other studies that all are more than that. So echoing, um, uh, echoing my message uh, that you continue surveillance for HCC after cure of HCV among patients with cirrhotics because of their residual uh, elevated uh, risk. Okay, I think we, we beat this point to death, so it's time to summarize it. Among patients treated with DAA, SVR results in a considerable reduction in HCC risk. And I think the important point for me to emphasize is, while I got into the minutiae of the residual risk and who is at higher than what, I don't want you to lose sight of treatment means a lot of good things for a lot of people. So there's considerable reduction in the risk. SVR is much more important than how you get to SVR, whether it's DEA versus this should have read interferon. There is no difference in SVR-related HCC reduction between the DEA and the interferon. However, the absolute risk of HCC remains high in the 40% plus, unfortunately, that we expect of patients with hep C who reside in the US have progressed already to cirrhosis, their annual risk even after cure is elevated between 1.5% to 7.8%, and clinicians should take this risk into account uh, in conducting ACC surveillance. All right, uh, the, the next few slides are really for those who are into the HCC business. So there are people who develop already hepatocellular carcinoma, get treated, and they still have hepatitis C. With the arrival of the DEAs, it became easy to cure the hepatitis C. And then there comes this study. This study basically showed in a small, non-randomized, non-blinded, retrospective study from Spain that in a small number of patients who already had HCC, 
didn't receive transplant or resection, but received ablation, local regional therapy, they noticed unexpected early tumor recurrence in patients with hep C-related HCC, and as the title says, a note of caution. So the implication here, maybe there's something inherently bad about the treatment in those patients that led to early recurrence. So why would that happen? Uh, I have a few more slides later on, but just the summary is, uh, it's possible that uh, the DEAs, the treatments resulting in cure, um, have reduced the immune surveillance because hepatitis C stimulates, puts you in this upped, hypered uh, immune response. There are specific T cells produce cytokines with anti-HCC effect. And if you remove that by treatment, maybe you unleash that effect. So following this, fortunately, a bunch of other studies, uh, I have to say equally badly designed in the sense that they're small, non-randomized, non-blinded, uh, simply didn't report the same early recurrence. And uh, the conglomerate value here is about 12% uh, or so, as opposed to the 40% that was noticed early on. I'm going to move you, instead of small bad studies, into this study. Um, just one second. Yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, so in those small bad studies, what what people have noticed is the time between the HCC treatment and DA treatment mattered. So those who received hepatitis C treatment right after they got their tumor treatment seemed to recur more in the red line than those who received it later. Um, so there could be something about early treatment that is especially harmful, or it could be that these tumors never went away in the first place. Our large study that I've shown you earlier with the hundreds of thousands of people in it basically showed no difference in the HCCs that develop early or late in terms of their stage at presentation or their size, indicating that uh, there is no at least evidence from large cohort studies that the aggressiveness of the tumor is any different. Uh, this slide might look familiar to you. I've shown you the top part, that famous or infamous meta-analysis. The bottom part is HCC recurrence, which refers to the topic that I just brought up, the HCC that gets treated. You treat their virus, and perhaps they recur faster or not. And the answer was, at least from this meta-analysis, 0.62, which is lower than the risk of recurrence from the studies that were conducted in the era of interferon. And finally, uh, became the large multi-center US-based studies that compared HCC patients treated local regionally uh, who received hepatitis C treatment to those who are hepatitis C positive but did not receive hepatitis C treatment, large enough to detect 128 recurrences and again, you don't need to be a statistician to notice that there is no difference between the DA treated and the DA non-treated. So uh, even if you're an HCC aficionado, there is uh, little for you to know. So overall, the data do not support an increase in HCC recurrence with DA treatment. There is this issue of early recurrence, but most of the data point that it's likely at least to be just incompletely cured HCC as opposed to a true medication-related recurrence. What should clinicians do who care for this subgroup of patients? I think the most prudent thing is at least to delay the antiviral treatment uh, six to 12 months after treating the tumor, uh, just to make sure that the tumor at least received a, a satisfactory initial response. Okay, so putting it all together, there's HCV-related cirrhosis, and there is de novo cancer. Natural history, meaning in the wild, in the presence of untreated or uncured hepatitis C, 
Patients with hepatitis C cirrhosis, three to seven percent of them develop cancer per year. If you give them SVR, whether interferon or DAA, you reduce the risk in terms of interferon to 1.5% per year or less. And in case of SVR, uh, I mean, this is a slightly exaggerated thing. I've shown you the data. It ranges from 1.5% to 7%. It's elevated, but not as the natural history. As far as those who receive treatment for their HCC, what about their recurrence? Their natural history is 20% six months recurrence. That's with or without treatment. For the SVR data, there is something that is considerably low to no change six month recurrence. The reduction in the risk of HCC is really the tip of the iceberg. Here's returning you back to big picture. The tip of the iceberg of the benefits that affect patients with hepatitis C who receive treatment. You reduce the risk of decompensated cirrhosis, which is also you can consider a tip of the iceberg. You reduce the risk of developing cirrhosis, which is really important. And more importantly, if you cure them at cir no cirrhosis stage, the risk of HCC really, really plummets. This is 0.18, a hazard ratio, which those of you who know how to interpret uh, uh, hazard ratios, uh, it's quite a significant reduction in the risk of HCC. So the best way to prevent HCC is to treat them early before cirrhosis. Few questions remain unanswered, but are important. Is this as good as it can be? And the question is, do things get better over time after cure? There's preliminary good evidence that liver stiffness, which is liver fibrosis, indeed improves over time following treatment. So this is baseline, end of treatment, 44 weeks, 48 weeks, 72 weeks. And you notice that the mean value of liver stiffness measured by Fibroscan is decreasing over time. The question is, does that result in a corresponding decrease in the risk of HCC? It's still not known, although preliminary evidence suggests maybe. Over time, as fibrosis regression, HCC risk drops even further. Can you act based on that today clinically? Fortunately, the answer is not. Right now, if you cure them and they have cirrhosis, you're obligated to follow them up until you have some major documentation that their cirrhosis disappeared. Does that ever happen? Uh, I'm older, but in my days, cirrhosis was defined as this irreversible condition of uh, irregular regeneration and formation of regenerating nodules. Uh, there is growing evidence that SVR for hepatitis C results in actual regression of cirrhosis and reversal of that. So that's an active area for research. Uh, in other words, uh, the picture may look even better after a few years of follow-up. So what do you do? Assuming that the risk does not drop over time, you need to continue surveillance forever, and it would be cost-effective, because what drives cost-effectiveness is the annual risk of HCC. Assuming that if the risk drops, so your best case scenario today is to continue surveillance for at least 10 years after achieving SVR in patients with cirrhosis uh, who had hepatitis C. All right, so one thing is gross and useful, which is no cirrhosis or yes cirrhosis that determines uh, the risk of residual HCC. Uh, I find it simple and attractive, however, uh, life is slightly more complicated than that. This may be the biggest reason, in my opinion, what determines the residual risk of HCC. But there are other things that people are finding out. Nothing is definitive. I just want to give you a summary of it. So hepatitis C, some viral factors listed here, results in epigenetic imprints, whether you have fibrosis or not. And this may drive the HCC. There are interferon-stimulated gene inductions that may not go away even after cure, 
and that may disrupt immune surveillance, which is a major mechanism of cancer prevention. So this is a cartoon depicting the different immunological responses during the natural course of hepatitis C. So in those who have active hepatitis C infection, that's their viral load. It increases, but it maintains throughout. Importantly, they have an elevation of type 3 and 1 interferons during the chronic infection, but a plummeting of interferon gamma pattern, and that's what maintains the chronicity of hepatitis C. Uh, why I want you to know this, uh, because what happens after cure? I'm going to show you 15 studies that show immunological changes. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not showing you 15 studies. I'm just going to show you four lines that summarizes 15 studies. Those of you who know immunology may appreciate some of these things. Uh, so mucosal um, uh, immune tel uh, T cells are not restored after hepatitis C cure in the blood and only partially in the river in the liver. That's that's one observation. Um, uh, Gamma, uh, gamma delta T cell repertoires remain stable after hepatitis C cure. That's innate immunity. DAs do not normalize the increased frequency and activation status of T regs, T regulator cells, even after long term HCV elimination. And perhaps this has been most invoked in cancer that irreversibly impacts human natural kills, uh, killer cell uh, repertoire diversity. None of these are really smoking guns. None of these are available to be measured clinically, but it is where some of the research is focused to explain how and why and who might retain a high risk of cancer even after hepatitis C uh, cure. Um, so to summarize this part of the talk, uh, HCV is associated with an altered and impaired immune response. HCV cure partially restores the immune response. Interferon-stimulated genes and associated cytokine decline, but not to normal level in all cases. CD8 T cell responses can be partially restored in some patients. And some factors, like cirrhosis, for example, may impact restoration of T cell responses. Other cellular immune responses may be only partially uh, affected by hepatitis C cure. And the remaining imprints on the immune response may explain some of the clinical observations, such as recurrence of HCC after SVR. All right, so now I want to go back now to big picture. And this is a complicated but really important slide. If you're someone who's looking at 30,000 feet and say, what is going to happen to liver cancer? I already showed you. It's the fastest rising cause of cancer-related deaths in the U.S. And I just described the super duper treatment that works in every hep C years and slashes the risk of HCC considerably. So, how would that affect HCC in the US? Well, it depends on how it much affects something called population attributable fraction. It's this thing that basically tells you if you wipe out the underlying risk factor, how much or how large of a fraction of the cancer you can prevent. It's a product of two estimates, how common the risk factor in the general population and how strong it is. So hepatitis C is not that common. Four million is one to two percent of the general population. But untreated active hepatitis C is a very strong risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. So the combination of an uncommon risk factor with a strong virulent risk factor tells us that 20 to 25 percent of the burden of HCC may be removed if we treat hepatitis C actively and quickly and completely. Not related to this talk, but this is for your general knowledge, um, metabolic syndrome like obesity and diabetes, it's quite common in the general population, 30 to 40 percent, but it's quite a weak risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. But it doesn't matter because it's so common, even a weak risk factor would have a larger burden than hepatitis C, which is a well-identified villain. So what happens after 
what happens today is shown in this slide from our own study, the Texas Hepatocellular Carcinoma Consortium, and we're gathering patients diagnosed with cirrhosis in three major cities in Texas, and these are uh, not shown before data, but, but really, really interesting. Uh, those of you who deal with liver disease or even know anything about liver disease know that hepatitis C and alcohol, and to a lesser extent, hepatitis B, are the important risk factors for hepatitis, for cirrhosis and HCC. There used to be a time where there isn't a single patient who doesn't have this. So these are patients with cirrhosis. Look at the proportion of active hepatitis C, 13%, 28% in black, 13% in Hispanics, no one in Asians, and 23%. It's very low. This diffusion of treatment has reduced the prevalence of hepatitis C among patients with cirrhosis that you see in the modern clinical practice. That's why my talk today is so important, because all what you'll be dealing with is cured hepatitis C in cirrhosis and the aftermath of that, and therefore you need to know what is the risk of HCC and decompensation after you cured their virus. Perhaps next time I could shoot this slide first, because this is why this talk is important and timely. And if I can fast forward this next one. Perfect. So on a population-based HCV-related HCC liver cancer is finally showing a decline in the year 2014, confirmed what we saw in 2013, and finally there's a decline in HCV-related HCC. Uh, will this continue? And I want to leave you with two messages. There are two factors that determine the continuation of the decline of HCV-related HCC. This is the biggest one, the rate of diagnosis and treatment. You don't need more effective treatments. Our treatments here, I wrote 85%, it's really 95%. In order to reach the red circle, which is all hepatitis patients, to, to convert them into cure yellow, it's no longer more effective treatments that we have. It's diagnosis and treatment. Currently, the diagnosis and treatment is probably not 20%. This was four or five years ago. It's around 40 to 50%. In other words, half of all hep C patients still not diagnosed or treated in the United States. So that is our biggest opportunity for improvement. The second thing, perhaps lower in scale, but we thought we were done with hepatitis C in terms of new infections. We thought we're just dealing with those three or four million patients who got infected in the 1960s, 70s, and slightly 80s, and we were finally now detecting them, treating them, and curing them, but there is an uptick in the incidence or new cases of hepatitis C that seems to be superimposed with the opioid epidemic. Um, where for the first time in a very long time, the incidence of new hepatitis C infections is increasing, particularly in, in drug users of high-risk sexual behavior. So those two factors threaten the gains that I've shown a couple of slides ago. So um, my talk is important because I think if you're a hepatologist or related to a hepatologist or live in a practice where hepatologists are even loosely associated with, and I should add to those infectious disease doctors who do lots of treatment for hepatitis C, you should be living in a world with successfully treated chronic viral hepatitis. You should be seeing a lot more NAFL than NASH, another talk for another day, and another talk uh, and uh, alcoholic liver disease. So this is my last slide. Uh, there are changing trends of HCC in the US. It's still increasing. It's still the fastest cause of, of uh, rising cause of cancer-related death, but it's slowing of late. Hispanics are now the group at highest risk. There is a change in risk factors with less active hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And the focus now is on residual HCC risk factors, and you got a big dose of that tonight. 
Uh, there's more cured hepatitis C and suppressed hepatitis B. There's more NAFL and alcohol. And there's a changing in risk. You're going to be seeing a lot more people, but with a lot lower risk. And that's a challenging area to deal with. And I hope the information you got to, to this evening would be of use uh, on, in managing these patients. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I believe now it's open for questions. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Alsarag. Now I'll see if we have any questions. Okay, we have no questions as of yet. Um, we'll maybe give it a minute. If not, then if you do have questions that you think of later, um, you can absolutely um, email us at um, livereducation.org. Um, and we'll, we'll get to Dr. al to answer your question. Uh, there was, there's a question, I believe. I saw one in the chat. I'm seeing a question that says, why HCC is increasing in Hispanics? May I answer that? Absolutely. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, as I'm telling all the story about the cure and declining YHCC in Hispanics. So let me, it's a complicated story. It's not just Hispanics. It's Hispanics in southern states. So South Texas Latinos have rates as high as China, which has some of the highest HCC rates in the world. Uh, it's a combination of two things. More of the risk factors that we're talking about. Uh, slightly more hep C than Caucasians, a lot more alcohol than Caucasians, but the big risk factor, literally, is metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, central obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or the worst possible combination, which is the obesity, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, superimposed on viral hepatitis and or alcohol uh, use. Uh, that's one factor. The other factor, one of the few useful uh, genetic mutations that has been uh, uh, uncovered by those GWASs um, is a mutation in a gene called PNPLA3, and the harmful um, uh, SNP, uh, if you will, is more common in Latinos than in Latinos. So you have a combination of genetic factors, combination of environmental factors, and the third cause, there is something about ethnic and racial distribution of fat that also affects Latinos adversely, which is they tend to be, to have pound for pound more fat in their belly than their buttocks compared to other racial groups. And of this fat, there tends to be more proportion of it visceral, which is active inflammatory fat. So genetics, environmental, and distribution of obesity, these are the uh, posed reasons for why Hispanics are more affected than others. Thank you. Okay. There are no additional questions now. Um, but again, if you have questions, we can answer them at a later time. Um, I just want to thank you again, Dr. El Sarag, for your time. Dr. Thomas, thank you as well. Uh, thank you to Gilead Sciences for supporting this webinar, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. On the screen, you will find directions on how to obtain your CME credits. Additionally, please complete the program evaluation at the close of this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, Good. thank you. Um, and that will bring the webinar to a close. Um, again, if you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to get them to Dr. Alcarag.